Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us in our latest webinar on how to create an outstanding user experience on a, on a website. Um, and uh, what I thought we'd probably do first of all is just introduce uh, ourselves. So I am Richard. Um, I am Chief Digital Officer at uh, Black Sun. And uh, you know, I look after all of the digital work that is going out of uh, Black Sun. Um, Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Rich. So uh, Dan Kelly, Head of Digital Strategy. So really thinking about how we can tell the value creation story for our clients, thinking about stakeholder needs, how we're going to bring those to life through functionality creativity, content, and importantly today, user experience. So uh, I'll be taking you through some of the examples as we kind of uh, talk about this topic. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, so I thought what we'd probably do um, as a bit of an intro is, um, you know, before we kind of get started, just do a little bit around uh, introducing Black Sun for those of you that don't know us. Um, only a few slides just to just so you know who we are and what we do. Um, we'll then um, just describe the Web 100, as we call it, which is our benchmark of all of the um, you know, corporate uh, websites, um, and then around giving an outstanding user experience. You know, so we'll um, you know, just talk to you a little about some of the tips and tricks and so on. Um, there is a functionality at the bottom for any uh, questions you want to ask or drop it in the chat. That's fine. We'll pick it up as we go through. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously do feel free to ask because it's a very more productive session if people are interactive, asking questions and so on. And of course, um, you know, what you can see here is a link to the Web 100 research. So if you follow that uh, QR code, you'll go to the website and uh, be able to log in and you'll be able to see some of the highlighted stats across content, um, as well as the user experience, which we'll update after this session today. So hopefully, uh, you know, you'll enjoy some of the rich content there. Um, in terms of Black Sun um, and what we do, uh, basically we are a, a strategic international uh, communications agency really focused on stakeholder communications and helping our clients really communicate the value story between them and their key stakeholders. And it's fair to say that the three main pillars of our work are around investor communications and broad corporate reporting piece, sustainability in the SG communications, which is clearly rising up the uh, corporate agenda, and particularly in advance of COP uh, coming up imminently, as we know. Um, and uh, the third pillar, if you like, is the digital transformation. So really helping organisations transform how they communicate, engage with their different stakeholders through digital channels. Um, and whether that be, you know, investors or employees, customers, wider community and society, um, we have helped people, uh, organisations do that more effectively. And just so you're aware, we do offer a complete range of digital services, clearly digital consultancy uh, and the Dan's good offices around strategy and benchmarking, which this is a key part. Um, you know, how kind of user experience, content definition, design and creation, as well as ongoing development and support. Um, and Dan, do you want to just take us through, you know, a few bits uh, of work we've done recently and then we'll get into the Web 100 piece. So, yeah, just some examples of kind of work we do. We thought it'd be useful just to kind of touch on uh, these so you can understand, obviously, the breadth of our expertise. So corporate websites being our, our bread and butter. The example you can see here is Coco Hellenic, where we've created not only a group site, but over 26 country-related sites as well in terms of helping tell the story. And you'll see this as an example we'll use later on to really think about how we can enhance their user experience uh, across the piece, aiding navigation, findability, and also some really nice kind of interactive features as well as we bring all of that to life. The other example I'll show you is uh, Inmarsat, uh, a satellite uh, company. Uh, and again, we've uh, created their B2B site and it's all driven around kind of increasing sales, allowing users to kind of engage with them as a, an organization in terms of finding out what the products and services that they've got solutions. So when you're on a, a plane and you want to connect to the Wi-Fi or you're in the middle of the Atlantic and you need a, a, a phone to kind of connect to, to shore, having the right kind of services and products. I'll show you how that navigation was brought to life a little bit later on. There's also a piece around data-driven sites, the Baltic uh, here in terms of the uh, Baltic Exchange the site that we created has got a, a huge amount of uh, personalizable data. So you can log in and actually track kind of, you know, the prices, the locations of different shipping kind of markets uh, and everything in between. And then we also then create things around online reports. So here the uh, Viva example, uh, and we've done a multitude of these over the years in terms of 
showcasing content at the right time of year in terms of a more interactive and uh, kind of uh, enabling kind of point of view in terms of showcasing video and thinking about how digital can add to the narrative of uh, the printed medium. Through to IR specific sites, so thinking about audiences and this being a uh, Sage is one that they've integrated with their consumer site. So thinking about what the audience's specific needs are when it comes to investor relations. So again, showcasing as you can see here a multitude of different things, call outs and different notions around news and reports, um, and in terms of the uh, the narrative that they're talking about. And the final example is really around kind of uh, additional kind of campaign uh, example sites. So here bringing to life a capital markets day for um, direct line group. And again, thinking about how we cannot integrate, you know, the, the, the pre-event kind of stage and registrations, obviously during the event and supporting that with the ability for users to kind of find the right kind of presentations. And then after the event, again, bringing that to life, integrating some of the great video that's been taken during the day and really kind of showcasing it to the, uh, the relevant audiences. Cool, thanks, Dan. That's great. Um, so what we thought we'd do is just really intro uh, the Web 100, um, you know, what we do um, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, what we look at. You know, we've been doing this now for um, seven years or so. Um, so this is the seventh in the series. Um, and what that done is uh, given really good insight into trends and changes that we've seen you know, across content and experience over those years. And I think it's probably true to say that, you know, back in the first year that we did it, it was a real kind of, um, you know, websites are much more of a kind of a static repository of uh, information and uh, reports and so on and so forth. Um, and over the last seven years, they've really transformed both content wise and experience wise to be much more live go to destinations that really communicate and engage with the different uh, stakeholder audiences. And um, so a real transformation we've seen. And what we'll take you through today is some of the things that we've seen around the experience changes. Um, and then the second half of the prayers will be much more centered around you know, some recommendations and advice we uh, would give you to create a great experience. So a bit of kind of knowledge share and best practice share, and then some uh, examples of how to do that yourselves. So in terms of bringing that to the uh, fore, what we wanted to do was showcase to you kind of what we look at. So thinking about the, uh, the metrics and, and kind of how do we denote what best practice is. So not only are we looking at regulatory requirements, uh, information from, you know, uh, bodies such as the IR Society, the FRC, thinking about user stats, analytics and, and beyond, and also then government regulations around the ICO, you know, the key requirements and, and, and things like that. But also obviously our, our experience over the last 15, 20 years of digital best practice and 200 metrics. So these are essentially questions that we ask ourselves in terms of does a site do this, does it do that? And understanding then how that manifests itself with best practice. So again, thinking about, you know, let's take an example for purpose. Does the site have a purpose page or does it promote purpose on the homepage? Yep, great tick. Does it bring it to life through the use of video? Does it engage audiences? Is it also being used on the wider kind of site? And again, there's a funnel to it in terms of then identifying what best practice looks like and then being able to kind of advise our clients on that as well. In terms of what we look at, there's no real surprises. It's really around experience and content. And in terms of what we're talking about here, it's really around that usability element to it. But also there's a, a number of other things that kind of intertwine with it. Things like findability, being able to kind of locate it and beyond that in terms of taxonomy, as well, I would argue in terms of the language used. And the content piece is really thinking about the different audiences and requirements. So things around investors, the media, sustainability, and understanding how we can bring those to the fore to make sure that they experience matches the content, but not only are things easy to find, creatively driven, interactive features, but also then adhering to the requirements around kind of uh, content and uh, best practice. And what we've seen in terms of the research this year is very much those uh, the themes that you see on screen here. Purpose-led, I've mentioned purpose already, and again, there's no surprises that that increases to, uh, to be an important kind of facet of it. Strategically connected, and again, this is going beyond in terms of not just having a, a strategy, but thinking about how that relates to how you operate, how you're governed, um, how you're thinking about kind of the, the case studies you might have in terms of bringing that to life, and a transparency beyond that in terms of then showcasing to the users what you're doing, how you're doing it, and they're you know, living and breathing that manifesto. 
And the final one is really around sustainability focus. And again, you know, businesses with COP26 coming up, businesses are becoming, you know, more attuned to how they can align with campaigns such as that. But also then thinking about how they can integrate things like SASB, things like SDGs, materiality matrix and beyond. And what we've done a number of these events now over the summer, and you'll be able to find out more details about this. But what we're talking about today is specifically around experience. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, so I thought what we'd do, first of all, is really just recap on what experience is, uh, what we mean by it. Uh, and basically, it's defined as the overall experience and satisfaction a visitor has when using your website. It sounds easy to, to do, right? Um, but, you know, why does it matter? Um, I mean, research shows these uh, a couple of interesting stats for you, which is basically it takes 50 milliseconds to form an opinion of your website. And uh, for those of you who's driven by statistics, that's roughly a half a blink of the eye. Now, clearly that's driven by a number of different elements within the website. So 94% of that clearly is design elements, given it was that fast. You know, clearly, you know, things like logo, images, navigation, color, typeface, you know, all those things have an immediate impact. And 6% is content. Um, so that is clearly a, a huge driver around user experience of the first impressions. And clearly as you go through the site, access content and so on and so forth, you know, clearly one's impressions can change, but it's quite interesting, I think, that these are the first elements of the uh, impression that users have of your website. And clearly, if we get it right, firstly, we get greater satisfaction, we get more time on the site and more repeat visits, and ultimately, it's more effective communication, so they end up with a deeper understanding of you and your organisation, your value creation story, and the wider benefit you deliver to, uh, to society as a whole, all key drivers. And so what we're trying to achieve is that a person of average ability and experience can figure out how to use your site to accomplish something without it being more trouble than it's worth. And how many sites do we go to in our lives where that, that doesn't happen? But if you like, there are three key success factors that we look at. You know, firstly, it's around effectiveness. In other words, how successfully is a user able to use the website to be able to get around, to understand what to do, how to use it, and so on. There is then efficiency, which is actually how quickly can the user complete a task? How quickly can they find your purpose? How quickly can they download a report and so on? And the third is around enjoyment. So how good did the user feel about the experience? Because you can, after all, have an effective and efficient website, but actually it's not very enjoyable because it's all tiny fonts or whatever it might be. Um, so these three things all need to be balanced out when developing and creating an effective uh, and useful uh, user experience. So the desired outcome we want to these four things, which is it's compelling, oh, it draws me back, wants, makes me want to uh, you know, explore a bit further. It's usable, i.e. effective and efficient, as we talked about before. It's simple, and I think this is one of the things we'll pick up today when it's still dance thunder, but this is definitely one of the trends. You know, it's quick and easy to do what it is that you want to do. And at the end of the day, it met my needs. I got what I needed to do. I completed the task I wanted to do and so on. And I think particularly, um, dare I say, in, if you like, in the corporate world, there is a real mix of high web experience and novice users. Um, and, you know, we find this in every day of our kind of research and analysis of users across corporate sites. You know, people are incredibly time constrained. And with the tension split over so many activities, you know, really part concentrating, uh, you know, when looking at websites and they want quick answers. And actually, again, one of the other things that will take you through, one of the examples we're exploring in a bit more detail is all the different ways in which you can enable users to find, search and access content quickly. They also don't know your organisation, your operations, the jargon you use, and many of them don't care. Um, and, you know, again, this is particularly true when you're, uh, you know, talking to stakeholders that are outside the immediate circle, or perhaps close investors or current employees and so on. And they expect consistency. So wherever they touch the website, wherever they touch your organisation, through different channels, you know, they expect things to be consistent and the interaction to be uh, seamless. So we've got three themes. Dan, why don't you take us through the three themes that we found for the user experience uh, over the last kind of year or so? So very much aligned with what you were talking about there in terms of the simplicity, but less is more in terms of some of the stats we've seen in terms of allowing users to kind of, you know, simple interfaces and engagement. 
continuation of conventions. And again, this is around kind of best practice and seeing how businesses uh, and, and agencies that are helping them are, are using those conventions to really maximize the impact of good user experience. And then what we've also seen is then key messages and differentiators. And this is where businesses may be investing more time, more budget in differentiating themselves in the marketplace, putting over their value creation stories, putting together a more compelling argument for why they are different from their peers. And again, thinking about how interactivity can really articulate that and tell that story. So if we take you through each one of these, what we're gonna do is kind of go through a few stats and then probably drill into uh, a few examples. And I'll take you through those in a, in a browser. So when we're talking about less is more and that simple uh, effect, we're really talking about clear, concise user experience. So simpler user interfaces and greater use of space. So thinking about how audiences and, and design as well mitigate any sort of understanding of what I need to do, where I need to click, how do I find relevant information for myself. Shallower, flatter sites and quick access to content, basically you know, thinking about navigation, making sure it's easy to understand where I need to click. And again, thinking about the use of jargon. And again, to Rich's point about many users not caring, do I need to be talking in the right kind of language and thinking about you know, a, an inside out or an outside in approach in terms of the, uh, the taxonomy that I'm using. And when we think about it, more animations as content loads to engage users. And again, making that whole piece around interactivity, actually an engaging and compelling user experience as the user would then navigate through and down the page. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to show you uh, an Inmarsat example. So let's start with this one. And I'll just check with uh, my guys that they can see the, uh, the browser on the screen. So that's always a good start. So what we wanted to do was show you uh, Inmarsat. And I've mentioned this uh, previously in terms of uh, bringing the, the site to life. Very proud of the work we've done, increased uh, kind of the, uh, the sales and, and the, the business kind of hits and everything else in terms of the analytics. But what there is, is a multitude of different ways that a user can get to them. And what they were wrangling with is the understanding of their products and solutions. So do I know what the best type of phone is if I'm sailing across the Atlantic? Probably not. Do I care what the name of the product is when I'm connecting on a, a, a plane while I'm, I'm, I'm traveling around the world because I'm using their satellites to connect to the Wi-Fi. Again, probably not, but I know what the challenges are. I know what the kind of the needs of the audiences are. So what we had to do was find out a way of talking to those that are educated. And again, those that are maybe less educated about the specific terms of the business and what they need. So we provided a number of different ways, not only key messages as you land in terms of what you've seen in terms of carousel, but a simple drop down that allows you then to Think about what I want to find as a user and a quick way to navigate through to not only the sectors that they operate in, and I'll show you a little bit more about those in a moment, but also then drill down to the services and solutions if that's what you want. Or maybe it's that I'm actually looking to become a partner. And again, thinking about the different ways that an audience can navigate through. We provided a, a simple mega menu for the users to be able to drill down in terms of some of the more corporate uh, comm kind of elements, thinking about explaining who the business is, what they do, and again, being able to kind of get to levels where I can click quickly, easily, concisely down. But for solutions and services, we broke the model with that to really understand how a user can then think about the different areas. So here you can see the different sectors that the business operate in across aviation, enterprise, the government contracts they have, and maritime. And then when I drill across that, I can now see a whole different way of navigating through the site. So thinking about how solutions are going to be working. I need in-flight Wi-Fi. I need to think about the safety. I need to think about airline maintenance. Well, hang on. I, I also know that I have a Jet Connect system. You know, I have Swift Broadband. And again, different ways for different audiences and thinking about how you can quickly and efficiently get to the information you want. Once I have drilled down into that information, again, thinking about how you know, we can make it easy for users to find what they're looking for. Calls to action, contact us. But you'll also see here on the top right, we've now provided you with another way that actually, if you aren't sure what you're looking for, I can now maybe find the related services to in-flight Wi-Fi. And again, all of a sudden, I've been able to drill down quickly, efficiently, 
all the different types of information I need. And you'll see here very much kind of thinking about that sales funnel, get in touch, calls to action. What can I download in terms of the latest information and related kind of insights that relate to that content? And just for completeness, I'll show you the, the other element of this. And again, thinking about then support and the partners, again, providing them with a secondary level navigation. So if I have got things that I need to find out about, maybe with my ISAP phone and you know is broken, I can immediately go to the support levels that they offer as well. So again, providing multiple variations, but again, thinking about it from a simplistic user experience point of view. In terms of uh, other kind of things I wanted to just show you again, the whole simplicity of understanding where I need to click. Burberry, great example here of dynamic kind of, uh, you know, visuals and then ambient video when I land. Clear navigation across the site in terms of the different areas I want to be drilling down to. And again, understanding that as a user, I can immediately get a flavor for the business, the nature of what they're doing in terms of the work, the heritage, and I'm straight into things around the stories and the different press releases. As we use Imperial Brands, you'll see here that the homepage has a number of different facets for the different audiences, not only simple navigation for users to understand where I need to click, but also thinking about how I can then leverage that for audiences that want to drill down quickly and easily. And again, bringing their strategy to life um, in terms of on the homepage. And we go beyond this in terms of then helping users with kind of reporting as well. So Temasek Review is something that we've uh, helped with a number of years now. Temasek is a sovereign wealth fund uh, over in Singapore. And we do a, a lot of work with them around the audiences. And they, being a sovereign wealth fund, they obviously have a responsibility to the people of Singapore in terms of the, where the money is invested and how the business is performing. But also then there's a number of different audiences that need to kind of uh, find out how the business is uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, thinking about what they're doing, the investments they're making. So again, providing a simple way for an audience to kind of drill down into financials, what they're doing for the community. And again, just a slight nuance of being able to drill down before I then start looking at the overall challenges and beyond. There's a few more examples I just wanted to run through in terms of the, uh, the kind of thinking about that simplicity message. And Anglo-American is a site that always scores very well in terms of our, our benchmarking. They do really great work across the board with you know, showcasing things that are like purpose, one of the first to, to do that front and center. But I would say that when I look at this site, there's almost too much when I'm landing. I've got two levels of navigation. I've got messaging around kind of the different elements of this carousel that go across the screen. And I've also then got the messages that sit underneath it in terms of what I'm looking at. So where as a user am I gonna click? Where am I gonna get most bang for my buck in terms of where I'm gonna go? And just to showcase another example of this, any the, uh, the Italian uh, oil business, thinking about from an energy point of view, you know, they have a, a split navigation again, the who we are, the operations here on the left-hand side. You can immediately ask a question to find out more. And then you've got investors, media and careers that are using this little like geography. But going further, you can then start amending your own navigation. So I can click explore. I can then think about the different you know, topics and different things I want to do. So maybe I want to remove operations from the navigation, but I want to find out more information about the scientific research and maybe technology. And then when I come out of this, I can see that scientific research and technologies have been added to my main navigation. So again, there's a certain level of personalization I like, but again, thinking about simplicity, do I know exactly where I need to click to find information? Can I drill down? quickly and efficiently to what I need to do. Over the past few years, we've helped uh, businesses, we've talked around this in terms of the examples, in terms of B2B, B2C, and one of those was energy fitness. What it kind of helped uh, us kind of articulate was really the simplicity of messaging. When it comes to whether you'd want to join a gym or not, uh, you want to know what the benefits are and you want a simple sales funnel. How do I find the relevant information? Do I either want to join? Do I want to log in and find out what the latest classes is? Or do I want to understand kind of where they are located? So immediately I've got very simple calls to action. I've got a very simple message. And immediately when I drill down, I can find the nearest gym. So again, thinking about that hierarchy of messaging. And I think somebody that starts to think about this quite nicely is something like Tesco PLC. So again, aligned with the example I've shown you, like the Burberry's and the Imperials. Again, simple ways of navigating but bringing those messages to the fore very succinctly and efficiently. 
and again allowing the user to get a dynamic kind of uh, overview of the business and understanding maybe what the key topics are for them in terms of the narrative that they're bringing to life. Rich, do you want to take us through uh, the next piece? Yeah, so, um, you know, I guess the next uh, area that we uh, thought we'd discuss is really the continuation of conventions, because I think, you know, the first thing what we've seen is, you know, as Dan says, you know, less is more, so really making good use of the workspace, creating a bit of, uh, you know, activity and loading content onto the site as you go to try and draw the user and engage the user, probably more of a focal point around, uh, you know, hierarchy of content and so on. Um, but really finding different ways to be able to access content quickly, given everybody is time poor. So in terms of the continuation of them, um, you know, convention, what we've seen is actually a lot of organizations are focusing really uh, on what I'd call basics. So, you know, unsurprisingly, 97% of the sites have an internal search feature um, and 92% now are actually showing a mega pain drop down, you know, like we showed just then in the email set. So people can get to the second and third layer content very quickly. You know, coupled with that is providing a visible breadcrumb trail so you can see where you are in the site hierarchy and, of course, access to a site map. I thought that would perhaps be a bit higher than it is, um, but again, the majority of companies are actually showing that site map again to enable quick navigation. Um, and the other thing that, uh, you know, is probably um, more prevalent than it was a few years ago is really highlighting some useful links, usually in a different structure than main navigation, but things that you want people to call out um, and that probably access more frequently by uh, different users. So again, providing a different way to get to content quickly. I guess the second area is, uh, we called it new trends rebuffed, and I think I'd probably refine it a little bit to say, actually, because of the way and the complexity of the content within a corporate website, it's interesting that only 6% of the FTSE 100 have a hamburger menu on desktop. Um, and that is really because I think what people are finding is both of the profile of users, you remember right up front, we talked about sophisticated and more novice users. So you've got a big spread of different user types of corporate sites. And because they're quite deep uh, sites, we're finding that hamburger menus are not really adopted on uh, desktop, which personally I think is probably the, the right call if you want people to be able to find things quickly. Um, and uh, interestingly, only 3% use chatbots, and they tend to be focused again a bit more in careers area of the sites where there's a specific task to be performed. Um, I think that might grow over time, but at the moment, certainly the conversations that we have with clients are that you know, there's not as much utility for that within the corporate arena as perhaps um, other areas of, uh, of websites. Um, I think also what we're finding is, you know, the cross links are really beneficial. So the ability to promote the next best content in a tailored way um, is growing. So 84% now of sites have that across the site, you know, where on each page we're basically saying, here's the next piece of content that is the most logical or best for you to read. Um, and what we're seeing again, through certainly the analytics that we look at is that definitely extends the user journey. And if we look through analytics, you can see on each page, obviously the next jump that people make um, underneath that process. So again, I think that's a useful way to extend visit and make the site more useful. Um, I know cookies is the bane of our lives and um, clearly it obviously impacts a lot what we can do in terms of analytics. Um, but, um, you know, there's still a bit to go for all corporate sites to be compliant. Um, but at the moment, 65% of sites are uh, adhering to the kind of new cookie regulations around accepting cookies and so on and so forth. Um, if we then... Um, oops, the screen's really... Yeah. So um, we thought we'd just show you a couple of examples where I guess the more conventional approach to um, the user experience, and you'll see that through kind of the namings and the structures and so on. So Dan, do you want to take us through through that, please? Yeah, perfect. And I think, you know, we've seen on screen uh, three examples that we quite like, and I'll show you them in a browser in a second. But just to summarize them, you'll, you'll see that there are things that are, you know, promoting news, promoting social elements, promoting sustainability, promoting strategy. There are fundamentals to the you know, continuation of those conventions that really help bring them all to life. So what I do is just show you them in, in kind of fullness. So again, the, the Kingfisher example here, again, key messages as to why the business is there, latest news articles. And again, they've uh, looked at a hierarchy. So, you know, thinking about how they can showcase a number of different stories and then pull out ones that maybe need a bit more longevity to be staying on the homepage because they are slightly more important. 
some sync messages around the business. So again, introducing at a glance, the powered by Kingfisher strategy, and obviously then financials such as their latest results. Responsible business, again, thinking about how you can drill down into that and find out more, and then stay connected through social media. So I'm not scrolling huge amounts. The convention is that I'm providing users with very key elements that I can click through and find the information very quickly and easily. But again, it's narrative based. It's thinking about the business, what they're doing, how they're you know, operating. And it's exactly the same for the, the Berber example I showed earlier, where you know I got to this point where I was showcasing the different stories, the different kind of um, elements that they're working with in terms of the press, the ability to find out more from signing up, and then drilling down into things like purpose, strategy, and then showcasing the products. And I'll talk a little bit more about interesting ways of doing that shortly. And then finally, exactly the same with Glencore. So again, a really nice example, simplistic kind of use of navigation, but the ability then to kind of drill down, see the latest news, find out about the share prices, latest insights and stories into social media. And I think the thing to say with all of this is it's understanding what the user requirements are and how we can facilitate that in terms of showcasing the right kind of content in the right kind of way. And again, the conventions would dictate from a corporate communications point of view, that, that allows us to do it very succinctly and easily. The one thing I did want to show you was that we've seen a lot of development in terms of people using navigation conventions to showcase key content. Whereas a lot would argue that we have simple kind of approach of saying, okay, well, there's a bit about the business, there's a bit about the products and services you offer, investors, sustainability, media, careers, etc. Actually, a few uh, businesses have used it for specific long-term campaign content. One of those examples is all around COVID-19 and thinking about how you know, content could be promoted. Some have included it in the main navigation, others included it within the About Us. But what I thought was interesting recently, having looked at the National Grid site was, and again, simple messaging, but they're promoting COP26. They've included COP26 within their main navigation. It is that important to them as an organization. They want to make sure that you as a user are finding that information so not only am I on the homepage looking at the conventions of, you know, the About Us, the annual report, et cetera, but I'm then able to drill down directly through the navigation and find out how they're influencing the summit that's coming up and what they're doing all around the kind of different partnerships they have. So again, I think it's a really interesting approach of showcasing how flexible navigation can actually then benefit you in terms of showcasing what the key messages are and understanding from a usability point of view exactly how that's integrating. Now the question mark we had around kind of pulling all of this together is do we need to go further than just thinking about what corporate audiences think? So what we started to do was move away from kind of just listed organizations and think about how wider websites can help our learning around UX. And the Accor is a, a great example. They have a, an ecosystem of uh, kind of uh, websites because obviously all related to how I can book, uh, you know, the hotel or where I want to go and stay. But for me, a group point of view, they've got a really kind of nice way of navigating through the site. And I just wanted to pull this up as a, a I really like it as an example of the, the, the drop down menu. And we've shown you a few uh, in terms of being able to drill down quickly and efficiently to different levels. And you'll see here that they've got a little bit of explanation around the group. They've got the ability to quickly download to the different areas. Sorry, just quickly going across here with the commitments of the government so I can drill down quickly. What I really like is at the bottom where you've got this in focus area, at a glance, a core in brief, I can subscribe to email. If I go through, that changes to be relevant to where I am on the site. So as I'm going through brands, it's talking about the flagship um, hotel in Shoreditch. Careers, it's talking about talent. And again, it's a really nice way of kind of allowing the user to kind of focus in on what's important to them. If we look at different ways of showcasing products, thinking about consumer sites and what they're doing. You know, we talk a lot about Coca Atlantic, very proud of the work we do, but is there ways that we can bring to life the products more that aligns with that consumer element? And you saw a little touch of that when we're looking at Burberry. Products here allows me then to drill down quickly and efficiently to things like tonic water. And then all of a sudden I've got a bit more of an immersive experience, the bubbles going over the top. This isn't a corporate website I know, but this starts to tell a story of the business and they also articulate kind of who they are as an organization 
and tell the story of the products that make them. And obviously then related content allows me then to simply find other products. I didn't know gin and coffee was a thing, but hey, each to their own. Apparently life's too short to uh, have them separately as I'm sure many feel. But again, the ability to discover that, to find information, and then I can drill straight through. And again, it's just a really nice way of kind of finding information that relates to what you're looking for. And I think we see more of this across the piece in terms of using consumer side. And the final piece is really around, again, thinking about the product. So you'll see here a, a, a Skoda site all related to their, their latest model. And you can see there's the electric, there's the kind of the standard kind of petrol effect. And if I'm scrolling, immediately the car moves towards me. So I'm not moving down the page. Things are spinning on the page in terms of the, the numbers. I'm able to kind of move through and navigate with my kind of cursor. And as I scroll, I'm then able to find out more about the aerodynamics or whether it be around the, the plug-in charges. And I can click on these elements for more information as well in terms of then being able to kind of transition through. And again, it tells me all about the different kind of elements, the wheels, the, the, the wing mirrors and the seats. And again, I just think looking beyond what we think of as corporate communications, there are clues here for making us be able to tell more of a narrative story about the products, services, the business models and beyond in terms of uh, what our audiences are looking for. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I mean, I think what's interesting for me as well is that, you know, clearly the more immersive experiences, you know, the greater use of video and so on that we've seen earlier on, I think is also driven by the fact that clearly we've got greater bandwidth starting to roll out 4G. Um, and costs obviously a broadband and lower. So, you know, all those are real enablers for us to create a more immersive digital experience. Um, and that leads nicely onto the next thing, which is, you know, one of the things that we are seeing is a, more of a focus on organizations communicating or creating interactive features that communicate their unique points of difference or their key messages. You know, so there's some stats here. I know they're kind of content based, but, um, you know, they're actually quite interesting that we've led to that kind of key conclusion and investment in those kind of user experience elements. You know, 59 use case studies well for the narrative and to bring to life their value creation story. You know, 61% of sites are showcasing their thought leadership or insight articles, usually that play to what they see as their kind of core purpose or unique point of difference. Um, and, uh, you know, now we're at 78 using video across the site in various forms or other. And so again, you can see kind of how that focal point is on uh, some of the different shapes is taking shape. And that's kind of reinforced by the fact that, you know, they want to tell more around their kind of like the value creation story. So bringing to life their strategy, showing how that works in practice, the value it's created, the value it's driven to wider society, their business model, you know, basically is getting more interactive um, and uh, obviously linking through to the proof points within the uh, case studies or examples of how that's uh, brought to life for the organisations. Um, and then uh, finally, I guess the uh, you know the piece around you know thought leadership content you know that's exploded over the last year from twenty three to sixty of the sites that have that thought leadership content. And I think what that really does is lead us nicely into showing some examples where organisations have thought about what their kind of key points of difference are and how they brought them to life through the user experience or through interactive elements. So Dan, should we share a couple of those examples? Perfect. So um, the first one is Coca Lennox. So let me just uh, take you through this. So what we did was we created a 24-7 portfolio. And the whole principle here is around a business that has a drink, a snack, or any event in your life, whether it be from going to the gym in the mornings to going to the pub in the evenings, there is a Coco Hellenic product that is suitable for you and to enhance your life. And so we created this, uh, this wheel, interactive wheel, which allows the user to really kind of find out more information at each stage of the day, to be able to drill down into then, you know, whether they're at work and there's a product for you, and then directly find those products that are related to it and obviously then learn more about them at each stage. There's also the ability to then go to other kind of periods during the same kind of uh, time. So again, cross navigation of that piece as well in terms of being able to kind of navigate through succinctly and easily. And then beyond that, you know, thinking about how we can then learn more about it, the actual kind of drill down in the different products. 
So again, thinking about those products, how can we then articulate them? And again, lining with that Schweppes example I showed you earlier, but again, this is very much more tailored at that kind of the corporate audiences. And I think there's more we could do to help bring that to life in terms of the showcase. The other piece that Rich mentioned was really around kind of how you know, businesses are showing where they operate in a multitude of different ways. And I mentioned earlier, I, I am a fan of the Anglo site, although I, I always critique everything in terms of uh, kind of what we're looking at. But again, this is a really nice way of kind of being able to drill down in terms of where they operate and what they're doing. So again, key stats and elements, the ability to product, uh, pro uh, select products specifically around kind of different elements. And again, as I drill down in terms of each one of these regions and countries, I can then start finding out more information about where they're located, what they're doing. And again, within a few clicks, I can actually find specifics on the locations. I can actually find contact details, the addresses, um, and obviously then the commodities that they're working with. And again, thinking about how users can find more information. What is the value add of this whole process? And for us, there's very much a, a kind of thinking about the audiences. How do we tell that story? How do we use interactivity to, to get the best out of it? The other example I just wanted to show you was uh, around kind of the, the thought leadership piece. Now, I'll just reference here that, you know, the future smart mining is the example that you see from Anglo-American. And again, we've had a, a number of clients that have thought about using their own taxonomy, their own kind of, you know, trademarked kind of element. But again, what we've seen is that often users may get confused with where they need to be clicking. And again, it's a balancing act of education versus simplicity in terms of the user experience. But who does this really nicely is British Land. And again, they've got a news and insights section in their main kind of navigation. I can drill down into stories and insights. And again, nice little mega menu as I would expect to see from these guys, always performing well across our, our benchmark. And again, the ability to then drill down quickly and easily into the different areas that I want to and find out more information about it. But again, allowing me to then focus on the socials and then recent blogs around topics and news. And again, as I drill down into each one of these, the ability to search, to filter, and again, beyond that, obviously then read more and share as well. So again, simplicity, findability, and thinking about the different audiences and what they need to be doing. The final example is really around Barclays, and they've got their whole insight section, which I think is a, a wonderful kind of addition to, to their portfolio around kind of uh, thought leadership pieces. And they have different publications, they have obviously different reports, and how that relates to you as an audience. Now, what they could do better is actually linking these to the different sites, because when I'm going through, I'm now into a thought leadership section on barclays.co.uk. So what they're doing is they're creating a hub that then transcends them. But I think it's a really interesting model for, you know, as a group, thinking about the different kind of audiences that you're trying to articulate to, and also then thinking about the challenge of actually linking it to all of the different elements of your ecosystem and beyond. Rich, shall we go through the uh, final piece? Yeah, thanks, Dan. One of the things I also really like about that kind of little uh, 24 7 portfolio on CCH is the it looks at the browser for the time of day um, and highlights not only the time within the uh, feature, but it also then brings up the most relevant content for that time of day. And I always think that kind of thing is a really nice touch within the, um, within the user experience. Um, what we thought we'd do is um, just really give some, uh, I guess, what in the last few minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, if you do have any questions, do shout within the um, chat. But, you know, what we mean by the user, user experience and the elements that we think about to make a great user experience. I mean, this the next couple of slides are a little theory um, around it, but, um, you know, obviously then we'll uh, give some uh, indicators of how we go about it. You know, clearly what we're saying in terms of the user framework is that we've got a bunch of users that want to interact with your website. You know, they've got goals they want to achieve, which they form into tasks, and they have certain expectations, you know, that frame their overall user experience. And obviously that website therefore requires, you know, functionality and features delivered through a design that enables that overall positive user experience. And if you like, we think of these in these kind of five layers. So, you know, if you like, the, the most obvious and concrete way is the certain of the content. So that is visually, how does it all bring together, you know, what does the finished product look like? You know, that's then underpinned by the skeleton of the site. So, you know, things around uniformity and structure and hierarchy of content, consistent layout, 
navigation in the same place, et cetera. Um, that then obviously is driven by the structure of the site. Um, and clearly that's um, driven by many other things like you know, user journeys that we map through with the different audiences, understanding your different audience needs and the content they need. In other words, we've been defining the scope that's led to the delivery of that structure. And of course, it all begins with setting the strategy, articulating your clear objectives and vision for the site that derives everything above. And it's quite useful to think about it in those individual layers, because then what you do is break each of those layers down into these aspects. You know, so the strategy really is thinking around the user needs and the specific site objectives. The scope is, you know, what do we need it to do functionally? What do we need in terms of content requirements and delivery? And we can then develop the information architecture, the structure of the site, and the integration design. Um, and that ultimately leads into kind of the creative look and the feel and the visual through the service. Um, so then what we wanted to do was to just give a little profile as to, you know, the personas, which is right if you're a member of the bottom of that hierarchy list around, you know, kind of creating personal profiles to be able to map user journeys. So Dan, do you want to just walk through how we create those personas and what kind of things we look at in order to develop a great user experience? Yeah, so it's a key element to our, our kind of understanding of audiences to really kind of identify real people that have real challenges and real goals for the site that, uh, and how we can articulate that in terms of, you know, bringing it to life. So what we do is, you know, thinking about the different audiences, we'll work with the, the clients on that. We'll create personas that represent each one of those specific groups and their needs. And we'll actually go to the level of detail that is, you know, name, job, function, because essentially they need to be as real as possible because then what we can do is then prioritize content needs, features, functionality, and then go beyond that in terms of then thinking about how we articulate a site that delivers what they need it to do. So focusing on the whole team on that is really kind of an interesting kind of challenge for us. And what it does is help kind of articulate with the stakeholders to understand the different needs of the business. And what we do at the workshops is really understand how they fit together. So again, it can be a really interesting exercise that all of a sudden the finance team are also talking with sustainability about the different types of personas and understanding what the different types of groups require. It also then helps us in terms of content, but also then features and functionality. And thinking about those cases, and as Rich kind of alluded to, things around the, the, the browser timings for that CCH piece was really developed at that workshop shop stage of saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if I'm loading, you know, loading the page at midnight and it's coming up with something that's relevant versus I'm loading the page at 9 a.m. So again, these things are discussed at this level and thought about how we can enhance those elements for, for users as we go through. And that drives the information architecture, that drives how the site's structured and, and what we're thinking about to those layers of the cake that Rich just showed you. But it also helps us in terms of the later levels of, of projects in terms of design and obviously then thinking about development and testing. And just for an example here, you'll see, you know, what we create is really thinking about what are they looking for from the site? So an investor would be looking for solid investment propositions, strong share performance, et cetera. But also, what do we want them to think? What is the takeaway that we want them to kind of go away thinking, oh, crikey, this is a business that is balanced, sustainable, consistent, reliable. What are those key narrative points that we want them to think? And to get there, they're primary and secondary areas of interest. And again, this starts to then mean that we can think about the hierarchies. And you've seen from the conventions that we kind of uh, put on the home pages, understanding the hierarchy of how much information we need to be kind of aligning to each one. So when we're thinking about an investor site, like the Sage example I showed you earlier, focusing on these primary areas of interest as an investor, versus then a Burberry site or a, an imperial site that has to deal with other types of audiences as well. Where do we draw those lines and how do we make sure that they're manifesting themselves in the right way? Right, and I think, um, you know, there are four real enablers for the user experience. You know, firstly, there's the overall site architecture. There's then the labels that you use to signal where the content is and where people should go. And obviously the navigation relates closely to that. So what are the different ways you can navigate and access the content? Um, and of course, how can you deliver the content in what I'd call a kind of web-ready format? I think also we're seeing a real trend around what I call layering of content. And you notice that in some of the examples that Dan showed, you know, where you might go on a section page and get an introduction and overview of the actual content, and then you can deep dive into it. 
and we're seeing that definitely a, a particular trend uh, on the sites. So when you think about the site architecture, you know, what do we mean by that? Um, well, I think it's really driven by those user journeys and the personas that created. You know, we talked about using conventions so people understand what's going to be in each of the sections, how the site sections and areas are built up. Um, and we definitely are looking at sites that are, you know, no more than three levels after the homepage. And so you should be able to uh, navigate very quickly to any areas of content and flatter wider sites are much more de rigueur than the, uh, you know, deeper dive exploration ones that we've seen in years gone by. Um, and all the advice is that you shouldn't have more than eight primary navigation sections because A, people don't know where to go, um, but also it's uh, not great in terms of being able to view things on, you know, uh, mobile or, you know, um, iPads at landscape uh, resolution. Um, and in terms of labelling, by labelling, what we mean is uh, obviously how you're signposting where things are. So there are things like navigation labels at the top there. And um, this page title, so you know where you are on the content that you're looking, obviously very important as well for um, search engine optimization. And then, of course, there are simple things like icons. So actually knowing the title, you know, is it a PDF, is it a document, is it a video, and so on, is useful to know. And uh, icons down at the bottom there, you know, often used for things like social media. So again, you can use visual indicators to uh, know what type of content you're going to access. So the principles that we would look at in terms of good labeling are clearly call things by their correct name. Um, i.e. things that people will understand the content. And if you remember right at the beginning, we talked about novice users and experienced users, but you need to know that people of an average ability understand what it is that you're trying to get them to do. Have to remember the spacing for mobile and tablet devices, i.e. for you know, finger touch, um, and be consistent across the site. So call it the same thing across the site, wherever you're accessing it for, whether it be responsibility section, investors, and so on. And use the terminology your users would use, not your internal jargon. Um, and use icons. Obviously, it makes the site much more visually appealing. But again, that's one area where I'd say definitely use conventions so people understand what a share icon is, what a social media icon is, and so on. Navigation is uh, an important facet of this. And I think what we mean by kind of the purpose of navigation is thinking about how it determines findability. So again, how do users discover and retrieve information and be able to find it again, you know, if you're drilling down through a site. And the primary areas of this are really kind of, you know, providing guides, thinking about conventions and allowing them to find content they're looking for quickly, easily, and avoiding those dead ends. And again, that relates to those related links that Richard was talking about, but also flexibility on the route. And again, you saw that within the, uh, the Inmarsat example I showed you, and thinking about how users can navigate and think about, you know, different ways of finding the relevant information. And there's some elements that are often forgotten in terms of, you know, it, it tells you where you currently are, it tells you how to use the site, and it gives you confidence. And again, things like that are, you know, really intrinsic to the user experience. So, you know, fundamentals like the breadcrumb trail are something that we'd always recommend, because then again, a user understands where they are and where they need to go. So you'll see here, you know, things around global navigation at the top, breadcrumb trails on the site, contextual navigation within the page, and then supplemental navigation, such as the related links, and also then in the footer. And then beyond that, other elements of navigation are the indicators. So the line underneath the About Us tells me where I am within the navigation. The little subtleties of the, uh, the breadcrumb trail using a, a bold element of which page I'm on versus the pages that were before. And again, simple things like page titles. And for mobile, again, the convention is really kind of consistent as, uh, with the desktop in terms of making sure that the structure is the same. Convention around how users would navigate through it. So again, the ability to click on or click through sections. So again, if I'm clicking on who we are, I'm going to the who we are page. If I'm clicking on the arrow, I'm going to the pages that sit underneath it. And there's different variations for this that are used. But again, sticking with those conventions so the users understand what they need to be doing. Switching to the hamburger only iPad again, you know, thinking about you know what that transition states are like, making it clear, you know, what goes to where, and I've mentioned the sub pages, and highlighting the importance of clear in-page navigation. So once I have navigated through, it's clear where I am and where I can also go to. And the final piece with the uh, the time we've got left is just around content. And again, thinking about this from a visual hierarchy point of view, 
what's most important, what needs to be prominent. How can we make sure that we are also linking things that are related and maybe relating them visually? And icons is a great way of doing that, as Rich kind of thinks, you know, attested earlier. But also nesting and grouping elements. And we do a lot of this when we're thinking about the sitemap structure of a, a page and also then the actual page structure itself when we're getting the content from. Because again, how can we nest content, how we can group elements and how we can tell a story is really important to the, uh, the hierarchy on the pages and break those pages up make sure there's clearly defined areas that can be done through images that can be done through kind of title text and again good semantics of making sure that paragraphs aren't too you know wide and, and too deep in terms of the content and make sure that you know it's obvious what's clickable on the page and again you'll see great conventions of that use of color use of buttons and the ability to understand exactly where i need to be going and how. and there's also text formatting again you know, plenty of headings, headings near the text, near the text that relate to you, keeping paragraphs short, those bulleted list items, and obviously then the highlight, uh, highlighting those key terms. And also remember, omit pointless words, don't include anything that maybe is, isn't intrinsic to your messaging and your narrative, and think about those instructions in terms of making sure UX is clear and concise. Rich, you want to take us through the sum? Yeah, great. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so that was our little uh, canter through of, you know, the elements that we think about in creating great experience. I hope you, uh, you know, enjoyed also some of the examples we showed earlier of what we're seeing within the corporate website and also in sites, uh, you know, beyond that, because obviously it's good to draw from the wider experience rather than, if you like, the narrow field of corporate websites. Um, and I think what we shared with you today overall in terms of user experience is we're definitely seeing trends to less is more. So what I mean by that is more visual, more spacious, um, you know, more, I guess, succinct websites with layering of content so you can get a real nuggetized view or you can do a deep dive. And um, we've seen particularly in the corporate side arena, I think, are sticking to conventions, particularly where it aids users to either find the content or to access deep content. Um, and we're seeing organizations invest more in developing both content and user experience that communicates their unique point of difference, you know, how their purpose connects with their value creation story. I think those are probably three really useful uh, trends that we've uh, seen in uh, user experience over the last kind of year or so. Um, so, I mean, if you would like to know, that's the end of our kind of core presentation. If you'd like to know how your website stacks up, we we'll definitely uh, talk to you both across content and user experience. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very happy to talk to you. You can either do a summary review or you can do a full report. Um, but do reach out if you'd like us to do that for you. It'd be a great conversation to have. And we've got other examples we can show and uh, perhaps uh, understand some of your key challenges. That'd be great. Um, and if you do want to uh, look at some of the results in more detail, um, you can follow this QR code um, and you'll see some of the stats and key findings across the content. And we'll publish some of the user experience later in the day or first thing in the morning for you. Um, so as I say, do feel free to either get in touch or look at more information on the website. Um, if there are any final questions in the last minute or so, please feel free. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for your time today. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, have a great day and the rest of the week. Thank you.